morning and thank you for joining us today for today's Georgia Falls Free Friday presentation and discussion. My name is Sharon Nee and I am the program director and a member uh, program director for the Injury Prevention Research Center at Emory and I'm a member of the George Georgia's Falls Prevention Task Force. Today's Falls Free Friday webinar is staying safe and healthy during COVID, how it relates to falls risk. This presentation will be recorded and made available via YouTube. To reduce background noise, please keep yourself muted throughout the entire presentation. If you would like to ask questions, please enter them into the chat box at any time. <clears throat> if we do not get all the questions, we will get the answers to you. We would like to thank our entire Falls Prevention Task Force for their dedication, expertise, and patience as we work to bring what has traditionally been an in-person event into the virtual world. We would also like to thank the Injury Prevention Research Center at Emory, Department of Human Services Division of Aging Services, the Department of Public Health, the Shepherd Center and the Georgia Trauma Commission and Foundation for their support of these webinars. Also, I would like to mention that uh, the Falls Prevention Task Force supported the National Falls Prevention Awareness Week that was September 21st through the 25th of 2020. And we've already had three Falls Free Fridays. Am I at risk for a fall? Three important words, medication, exercise, and change, hearing, vision, and blood pressure sugar, Tai Chi and music therapy, and today, staying safe and healthy during COVID. It is my honor to introduce to you our wonderful presenters for today. Amber Martinez. Amber is a clinical research coordinator on a falls prevention research study at Emory University. She has a master's degree in social work. Her work has focused on social and behavioral factors that affect older adults. Angie Stong. Angie is a clinical research nurse at Emory University. She has her master's degree in nursing and has spent the last 20 years working in clinical practice. Her career has been focused on women's health and falls prevention. Renee Brown. Renee Brown serves as the Chief Dietitian for the Georgia Division of Aging Services, a section of the Department of Human Services. She leads a state-level planning team to implement wellness programs and senior hunger initiatives, including home delivered and congregate meal services. Her primary goal is to reduce mal malnutrition in older adults by creating socioeconomic frameworks that treat and prevent it. So again, it's my honor to introduce these speakers. And our first speakers are going to be Amber and Angie. So take it away, Amber and Andrew. Angie. Thank you, Sharon, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Sharon said, my name is Amber, and I'm presenting today with my colleague, Angie Stong. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about being safe while being out during the COVID-19 pandemic, social isolation during this time, and staying connected in a virtual world. So first, we're going to touch on being safe while being out. Um, I think this has changed vastly over the past six months for a lot of people, um, but there are things that are important to do um, in order to keep yourself healthy that may require going out. Uh, there are additional precautions that I think we can take and we'll go over those as we discuss. So the first thing, going out to exercise, um, obviously being locked in our homes during um, this time or being asked to quarantine has been tough in a lot of ways, but one way that it's tough on our bodies is we're not exercising our muscles as much. And when that happens, our muscles lose that strength and that can put people more at risk for falls. 
what we would want to encourage, especially while the weather is beautiful this fall, um, is try to exercise outside. Um, this will keep your muscles strong and help avoid falls. So um, again, in lieu of gyms, um, instead of going to a crowded gym and, and you know having to wear a mask um, and constantly sanitizing things, going outside is a great alternative. Um, if you're out alone um, and there aren't people around, then you're able to kind of take your own path, um, go at your own pace. And if you want to feel connected on a walk, another great way to do that is to call a friend. Or uh, one thing that we've done in our, um, with our research team is we've, we've worked with some patients at Emory to get virtual walks going. So what that looks like is setting up a Zoom conference line and everyone calling in and going on a walk at the same time, um, which is really great. We have um, a, a physical therapist on our team who will kind of explain walking mechanics and um, we can get conversations going during that time. And I know I personally feel really great after participating in those kind of things, even though I'm walking alone, I, I feel connected to people. Um, I feel safe because I'm not at greater risk of um, contracting any any germs and I am able to, to still keep my body healthy um, and keep my muscles strong. Um, um, a couple things that we found actually on these virtual walks are that um, sometimes accessories are nice to take along with us. Um, so if you're calling a friend, we want to make sure we have good arm swings when we're walking. We want to make sure that um, we're keeping good walking mechanics. So um, having your hands free is great. So bringing headphones if you're making that phone call to a friend um, is wonderful and making sure you wear things that have pockets so that you can keep your cell phone in a pocket and connect it to your headphones. Um, a fanny pack has also been re <laughs> really popular among some people in our walking group. They uh, they say they can you know they can keep their phone in there their keys um, if they're not using their headphones they can stash them in there so um, that's a great thing to take if you're going on a, a longer walk and just need more space to hold things but want to keep your hands free as well. Um, there's also some home workouts available via Zoom. Um, we have a couple resources that you can check out in our presentation, but if if, if you if this is something you're interested in learning more about, Angie or I can definitely forward additional resources over to you. Um, and then the last thing about exercising outside is consider bringing a walking stick, um, cane, or walker. If that's something um, you feel like you usually use, then absolutely, we wanna make sure you're bringing it. But even if it's something that's new for you to utilize, um, just since we've been sitting so much and if you're just starting to get back in the swing of walking um, and maybe get ambitious with the longer walk, it's good to take something that you can rest on a little bit. Um, so consider bringing one of those items on your walk. Okay. And Angie? Thank you, Amber. And um, again, I'm Angie Song and Amber and I work together. We're colleagues on the same uh, research study. And as Amber had touched on, just getting out and exercising has been so important. Um, a lot of fears um, when you, we talk to individuals, our particular group that we work with uh, is targeted towards individuals 65 and older. And going on to the next aspect of you know, going into doctor's offices, one thing that we've seen, we've had the privilege of uh, pivoting our uh, research project into telehealth, which um, was something that was initially back in March, just an idea and a thought. Um, and I think we all initially had projected at the beginning that within two or three months, things would be maybe operational back to normal. Um, I'm not sure what our normal, I think we're uh, mi migrating into a new normal <laughs> um, for the duration. So um, initially when patients were rescheduling their uh, doctor's appointments, they were under the thought, um, as well that maybe it would just be a temporary um, type of um, pause. And now we're seeing that uh, physicians and providers, PAs, even physical therapists, what we once thought would be a difficult task to maneuver, um, even those are now being done with telemedicine. However, of course, there are things that we're not able to accomplish, things like lab draws or an evaluation of a physical um, complaint that needs to be evaluated in the office. And um, one of the things that we're doing is I'm seeing patients on telemedicine and going into the doctor's office is 
you know, reassuring these patients that um, one, that they, there are things that need to be evaluated. We don't need to delay um, for something that might require immediate attention. So we're talking about uh, proactive measures of, of staying healthy or how it's going to look once you go into your doctor's office. Um, they um, have questions, so many patients have questions about you know, getting on the elevators, um, in the parking garage, um, being in the doctor's office, if we're gonna be adequately uh, social distancing or how the doctor's offices are going to be mitigating risk um, for spreading um, those that might have been in the office with previous COVID cases. So those are all things that um, you know, are questions prior to going in but um, as the focus for falls prevention for us and how Amber and I are working with these patients, um, whether they're being seen by telemedicine or going in the office, is we're looking at things that can pot potentially um, be a risk for these patients, such as uh, medication. If they've been on any new medications, potential side effects that we're looking at. Um, are these medications putting them at risk for um, complaints of dizziness, are they lightheaded, um, orthostatic hypotension is something that we're evaluating. And um, again, through this telehealth measure, we're able to um, have blood pressure cuffs at home, having patients um, um, doing a couple of exercises to see if they're at risk um, for blood pressure changes, um, usually from a sitting standing position or a lying to sitting position. We're able to evaluate that. Um, and again, just stressing to patients that, um, again, uh, we want to be sensitive and understand that during this time, there's a lot of hesitation in being evaluated, but we're hoping this new measure in carrying out telemed has put some of the, uh, the fears at ease that we're able to accomplish these things actually in their home, which has been um, really exciting for us to, to see it um, kind of pan out how we're able to accomplish assessments that we once thought um, might be difficult to achieve. So um, we're, you know, making sure that we're looking at home safety hazards, that we're assessing um, if they've had, excuse me, some muscle weakness um, changes with COVID. A lot of patients have not been as active. They've had a lot of fear. So we're trying to really um, spend some time with patients talking about their concerns and fears and maybe how we can um, help accomplish if they're going to go into their provider, which is still important during this time, so they can be evaluated for any health changes, um, and also how we can accomplish this at home um, for those that um, can still be evaluated and still achieve a lot of these um, assessments through the telehealth model of Zoom. So um, again, like Amber had said, um, it's not only important that we're talking about their exercise and changes during COVID, but um, how we might be able to uh, mitigate falls over this time that they've had a lot of changes in their normal routine activities. Okay. Um, so now that we've covered uh, being safe while being out um, and doing things that will keep you healthy, we'll talk about um, another effect of being isolated in our homes is the social isolation piece. Um, you know, obviously at first I think people were really and st are still using the term um, social distancing. Uh, I have heard people really trying to get physical distancing as, as kind of the new way to phrase it, um, just so that, just so we can really in reinforce the idea that um, we, we still need to be social and we can be social in, in different ways. Um, it's just the physical distancing that, that can help us during the times of COVID. Um, so social isolation can be hard on our mental health. We are social beings by nature. We, we generally like to be around our loved ones, um, our friends, our family. And so being isolated from these people for a long period of time um, can create completely normal feelings of depression or prolonged feelings of sadness, um, which I again want to emphasize is a normal reaction. It is, it is not, um, you, are, you are not different than the rest of the population um, in feeling this way. And it can, which can affect your overall health. Um, 
and it, it can actually even be a risk factor for falling. Um, the CDC has found that people who experience depression or prolonged sadness um, are at a higher risk for falls as well. So the CDC does recommend uh, taking care of your body. So that's kind of what we talked about in our previous slides, um, that if you're gonna go out, how to be safe about it. Um, so for instance, going outside to exercise, taking care of um, your muscles and your, your cardiovascular system. And then going to the doctor is also taking care of your body. So um, you can take precautions there and, and the clinics at Emory are, phys are physical distancing, doing temperature checks, asking everyone to wear a mask. Um, so those things are important to continue to do is taking care of your body. And then connecting with others. Um, we, we touched on this, I think, during our the slide on exercising outside. So taking time to um, call someone. It doesn't, if, if you have FaceTime or Zoom and you're comfortable using it, it's great to see someone's face. If it's not something you're comfortable with, it's just as great to hear someone's voice. Um, just to be able to connect and talk. Um, and if you can if you can do that while getting outside and just getting some fresh air, I think that's a really great combination as well. So try to stay connected to others. Um, and then taking breaks. So um, I think giving yourself I know when the pandemic first started, everyone I think was on an organizing kick. They were thinking, I'm gonna be so fit after this pandemic. I'm, my house is gonna be immaculate. Um, I'm gonna do all those things on my errand list that I've, I've been meaning to do for months. Um, but that's not necessarily a break. That doesn't, um, if it doesn't recharge you, if it doesn't fill you up, then doing those things may just increase your the burden that you feel to, um, to get things done and maybe feel like you're not doing enough and and that's not necessarily a break so making sure you're taking really deliberate time to invest in things that you enjoy and that make you feel rested so that could be different for everyone if that's reading a book if that's going for a walk um, if it's cooking baking um, or even just sitting outside and just doing nothing um, those are if those are things that recharge you then those are things to take advantage of and, and really reflect on on what you enjoy. Um, and then next, staying informed is important. So making sure you're getting quality news, um, quality updates and information um, that has been validated. Making sure to stay informed um, can help decrease anxiety because you, you kind of have an expectation of what's going on. Um, you may feel a little better knowing like what the future might hold um, and what's going on in the current moment. But I will say avoid too much news. Be really cognizant, be really aware of when it's starting to make you feel anxious or sad and stop. You know, it, a lot of our 24 hour news networks, they're honestly repeating the same information. So it's okay to take in a little bit of it and then turn it off, switch to something you enjoy, take that break and rest. And then last, seek help when needed. So as Angie touched on, um, a lot of doctors, a lot of specialists are adapting to, uh, to this new world that we're living in. And it is totally possible to see your doc, to talk to a doctor over the phone, to see them over a computer. Um, if you do need to go in person, that is an option for a lot of doctors as well. Um, but also friends and family, uh, don't forget about them. We have professionals who um, are wonderful. And I think if, if you need, um, if you need assistance beyond what a friend or family can give in terms of medications or therapy, you know, definitely seek those out now. Um, but also just rely on your on your social support systems because they're important as well. I apologize, I didn't realize I was mute. So as, um, and staying connected in the virtual world, of course, that's what we're talking a lot about the changes moving forward. Um, and Amber's touched on this, um, just keeping active and trying to maintain some type of physical activity is so important. Um, physical activity is often connected um, to our you know, physical health and our mental health as well. Um, I saw that Sharon um, put something in the chat box, you know, talking about a lot of religious organizations. Um, one thing that we've done as we are in this um, particular with Emory University that we're working with the study and talking to individuals, um, most of those that are in, have been involved 
in some type of community resource um, like the YMCA or for senior groups where they offer a discounted um, price that have been feasible. Uh, a lot of these patients too um, and participants are um, financially um, have been a little limited and those factors have changed. So for them, they've verbalized talking about those classes that were once offered through the YMCA or community base that also allowed them to have some type of um, social gathering and that was not only um, participating in an active, um, being active in an exercise regimen, but has also given them an outlet to be able to socialize. And that was um, vital for um, just continuing with their mental health. I've talked about, you know, now that they're limited and they're nervous about getting out um, in social settings with groups of individuals, um, I have been uh, directing them to a lot of churches offer, um, it's paid for through um, donations through their church members or through their funds that they're able to set up these uh, virtual classes. Um, there's so many community resources that are still available for seniors. Um, we've been referring to Tai Chi. That's something that helps keep core strength and balance. Um, so staying active and fit have you know, been um, uh, vital for these patients during this time. And like Amber said, um, as many individuals, when you talk to initially during this time, they thought they would be using it to um, catch up around household projects and works. But a lot of people have um, just felt that they've been less active, um, keeping relationships active in a virtual world, like Amber's touched on. Um, I've talked to individuals who've had um, friends that have, um, they've not been able to see, and that was their only um, social outlet. They don't have family nearby, so they might um, have been accustomed to playing bridge or going to a community center where they play a bingo night. So now we've been encouraging them to set up Zoom, which um, ironically enough um, has kind of forced those that are not um, <laughs> familiar with or don't maybe want to use a computer as much had, has opened up the opportunity for them to become more um, socially engaged through um, Zoom or FaceTime. So um, a lot of them have verbalized to me that they feel like they've learned a new task, <laughs> one that they thought that they weren't that interested in, um, they've really enjoyed. So we keep continue to encourage that. And um, again, like I said, just getting mentally and physically healthy um, is going to help um, keep your immune system strong during this time. Um, telehealth appointments are almost um, exclusively offered, um, or not exclusively offered, but almost across the board offered through um, the provider. Their primary providers are giving them options for inpatient versus telehealth. Um, and then um, setting up a virtual book club or setting up, um, a, like I mentioned, a, a virtual um, bingo where you just have that opportunity to really socialize and get some um, socialization and FaceTime with um, maybe members that you're meeting new in the community. It's been um, as a way that we've been so incredibly busy in our lives before, and I've realized this, that we were so busy packing in errands and sitting in traffic that there's actually a little bit more time where we can connect with those individuals in our neighborhood um, that maybe we haven't um, had an opportunity to know before. So um, again, I hope uh, this has been some useful information. Amber and I have been really privileged over these last few months to get to um, switch to a telehealth option where we're getting connected with patients in our study and getting to know them, spending more time. I feel like it's been just a real privilege um, to get to see patients um, through telehealth. I'm actually enjoying that I am not on a time limited time frame um, from once where we would have been in a clinic. I'm getting to spend more time talking to them, um, developing relationship. They, I think they have felt like it's an opportunity just to, to get to have some time with an individual that they can um, talk to about social concerns outside of their health concerns. So it's been just a real privilege for us to be able to get to know these patients and not only address you know, their falls risk in the community, but really addressing other topics that are important for them to, um, to discuss with a, a healthcare provider. Um, and then if these are a few resources that we found um, that 
help with the topics that we've talked about today. And just to kind of give you an overview, um, Senior Planet, uh, they, I think they're an organization that usually does on that usually does in-person technology classes, but actually on their website, they have some available for free. So if you're, if you want to get more familiar with something like Zoom, um, you can go to seniorplanet.org and look through their free technology setup videos. Um, I think they even have some exercise classes on there as well. That's what I saw. Um, and then local libraries are doing um, book clubs. So there's an example of one listed here. And there's a virtual bingo online resource as well if you want to get one started for you and your friends. Um, I think it comes with bingo sheets that you can send out um, those things that you would need. And then um, mindfulness apps. So I, I if for people who find it hard to rest and not do anything, these apps are kind of nice because they walk you through how to how to rest. They kind of help your mind focus on a voice that's telling you how to breathe, um, kind of how to relax your body. And you can do it for a span of like five minutes or 30 minutes. And I know Headspace, they have um, they have a, a free option where you get a, a limited amount of um, recordings that you can go through and it'll talk you through that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Amber and Angie, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and next, we're going to be having a presentation from Renee Brown. And again, Renee is with the Department of Human Services, Division of Aging Services. So Renee, take it away. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you to Angie and Amber. I'm so excited to follow up with some nutrition tips to help with falls prevention. So if we head to the next slide, we'll take a look at some of uh, the missions that we have for the division, especially our main one, which is Stronger Families for Stronger Georgia. So I hope in my presentation, you'll find some way that you can help yourself and your family to meet your nutrition needs. So if we take a look at the next slide, we'll see our learning objectives for this quick session. I really want you to see what Nutrition's Connections to Falls is as well as current recommendations to prevent falls. We'll also discuss briefly how you can implement these during a pandemic. And hopefully if you're living with loved ones or participate in their care, I'll give you a quick list of hints that you can use to help them as they're following these recommendations. So if we go to the next slide, take a minute to just think about what role you think nutrition plays in falls. You don't have to type it into the chat, but just take a minute. Do you think it's a little bit, medium, or maybe it's super significant. What do you think? And if we go to the next slide, you may be surprised to know that nutrition plays a huge role in nutrition and falls prevention. Most importantly, nutrition status has been shown to be a determining risk factor for the risk of falling, the severities of the injuries incurred, and even your recovery time after a falls-related event. So it's key in making sure that you're getting everything that your body needs. If we take a look at the next slide, I wanna start by giving you an idea of what current research is telling us about nutrition's impact on falls, because I want you to be as informed as possible and to know where the information I'm bringing is really coming from. So just recently in 2018, two scientists in England conducted a literature review, meaning they took a look at the current evidence out there on this topic. They found a lot of research, about 98 publications, and ultimately they reviewed about 56. So today we're gonna to talk about the three main factors that they found in terms of how nutrition relates to falls. Take a look at that next slide to see what those are. So the three main factors that are nutritional risks for increasing falls risk are shown here. Malnutrition and sarcopenia, which is gradual loss of muscle, and we'll talk about that a little bit more vitamin D deficiency, and dehydration. But important to know is that efforts to address these specific factors have actually been shown to reduce falls. So I don't want you to leave here feeling sad or feeling overwhelmed. I wanna give you some quick tips to let you know that these are the risk factors, but there's a lot that we can do to help increase how we're doing them and therefore reduce our risk of having a fall. So this is the first one. Malnutrition and sarcopenia go hand in hand. And I want to set the stage in really defining what nutrition is and really going forward what malnutrition looks like. So here you'll see its official definition. Malnutrition is the deficiency, excess, or imbalance of a person's intake of energy and or nutrients. This is very important. 
because while we might be tempted to use weight as a sign of malnutrition, as you can see, you can have an excess or an imbalance of nutrients. And some might be getting enough food in throughout the day or even more than they need, but they're still missing out on really important nutrients. So keep in mind, even individuals who are at a normal or above normal weight range could still be malnourished. So keep that in your head as we go through this session. When we talk about malnutrition and its relationship to falls, one of the things that happens is our bodies get in a state of what we call a negative nitrogen balance. And this causes a reduce, uh, reduction rather in muscle mass, strength, and our function. And you can kind of think about this as a bank account. So if you take more money out of your bank account than you're putting in, you're gonna have a deficit, right? And your body works in a very similar fashion. If you're taking more nitrogen out of it in forms of proteins and kind of using up your energy, and you're not getting enough in, then your body's gonna start pulling from its stores, which actually is in our muscles. So if we're not getting enough protein in, our body is actually going to see a reduction in muscle loss, which we don't want. So that's the first thing to keep in mind in terms of malnutrition. Malnutrition can happen to anyone at any age, but our next factor, sarcopenia, is a gradual loss of muscle mass that is specifically associated with natural aging. So as we age, our bodies do change. Our metabolism becomes different. And because of this, we naturally lose a bit of muscle. Importantly, this muscle loss is strictly correlated with physical disability, poor quality of life, and even death. But I don't wanna scare you too much because we can prevent it and even build back that muscle in a few ways that I'll show you in a minute. Just keep in mind that this muscle mass can occur even if you keep the same weight. And you've maybe noticed this yourself. As Ambie, Ang Angie and Amber mentioned earlier, if you're not using your muscles, you might see that muscle loss occurring. So just as you age, you might see a similar fashion. Another thing that you'll often hear when you're aging is osteoporosis. And this is something similar that happens to bones. You have low bone mass that causes an increased risk of factors um, and fractures rather. So think about osteoporosis in terms of bones as what sarcopenia is for muscles. They're both causing that loss of mass and they can increase your risk of fracture. So we don't want that. The good news is that increasing our intake and a subtle lifestyle changes can actually help reduce how much sarcopenia we experience, and how much muscle mass we hold on to. Um, but keep in mind that studies are still showing that weight loss that's associated with sarcopenia may be a greater risk factor for falls than just having a low body weight. So even if you're at a low body weight, really look out for not losing drastic amounts of weight. We don't want that to occur. So how do we do this? Take a look at the next slide and you'll see two main ways that we can make sure we are preventing malnutrition and sarcopenia. The first is making sure you get adequate high quality protein. Healthy adults who are over the age of 65 need about one to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight every day. And while this might not seem like anything, I'll show you an example of a minute in a minute of what that actually looks like. And when you're thinking about protein needs, a lot of people like to think of individuals like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like big bodybuilders, muscles, but you might be surprised that just your normal intake is often enough to get adequate protein. We just wanna make sure that we're getting consistent protein throughout the day. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Keep in mind that this is an estimation for healthy individuals. Some individuals who have kidney disease or another acute or chronic disease may have different protein needs. So you wanna make sure that you check with your primary care team or a registered dietitian to see how much protein is needed for you. The second thing that is not quite nutrition related, but goes hand in hand with preventing malnutrition is engaging in resistance training. So previously heard about different ways that you can exercise and specifically physical activity guidelines for Americans recommend that older adults engage in strength training at least two to three times a week. And you want to make sure you're doing it to the point where it's kind of difficult to repeat another repetition. You know, you want it to be challenging. You want it to be building that muscle. And you can do this even into your 90s and still be building muscle. So that's often a myth that at a certain point, we just can't build that muscle anymore, but that's just not the case. As always, make sure that you consult with an exercise professional and your primary care team to make sure that you're doing the exercises that are right for you and you don't have an injury because of too much weight. That would not be much fun. 
So we talked earlier about what it looks like to get enough protein and the numbers can sound scary, but I do want to provide you with at least one example of how you can figure out how much protein is right for you. So take an example of a 150 pound person. We need this in terms of kilograms. And to do that, we just divide 150 by 2.2 and that equals 68 kilograms. Now let's see, let's say that we need about one gram of protein per kilogram times 68 kilograms, that's about 68 grams of protein per day. And you might be looking at me like, oh, Renee, that is a lot of protein. But you might be surprised to know that if you take a look at the meal plan that's in front of you, this is set to have about 30 grams of protein per meal. So this alone would get you 90 grams of protein. And you only need about 68 if you're at this weight level. So keep that in mind, if you are above or below that weight range, your protein needs are gonna fluctuate. But if you can stick to an adequate pattern in each meal, you're not so far off of your goals. One of the things from my personal experience that I see with older adults is that we just stop eating as many meals. Maybe our medications are causing our appetite to be lower, we're just not as engaged, and we're just not as hungry for three meals. So I really encourage people to make every bite count. Even when you're eating a meal, eating the protein first can be a really good way to get that in so that you're not filling up on empty calories or all your grains before you get that protein in. So small, subtle changes can do that. And finally, I wanna stay on the slide for just one more minute because I wanna show you one tool that can really help you if you don't wanna worry about counting numbers or even looking at a meal plan, you can use this picture. It's called the plate method. And here's how it works. Anytime you build a meal, and this is for people of all ages, but especially older adults, try to make half of your plate filled with non-starchy vegetables. These are things like leafy greens, broccoli, and carrots. Keep in mind that there are some vegetables like corn, peas, and potatoes that while they fit within our diet, they don't belong on this side of the plate. They belong in the next section, which is starchy foods. So if you see the top quarter of the plate there, that is supposed to be dedicated to starchy foods, like those vegetables I mentioned, the corn, the peas, the potatoes, but also whole grains, like whole grain bread, rice, pasta, quinoa, anything that you like to fill up that quarter. And then finally, that last portion of your plate is dedicated to lean protein. And when we say lean, we really wanna go for a cut of meat that doesn't have a lot of fat on it. Try to get a baked chicken, and if you can, try to get sources of fish as your protein at least twice a week. And oftentimes people as we age may have trouble chewing meat and we might avoid it altogether. So make sure you're working with your dental team to make sure that your dentures fit correctly, or you could work with community services to see if you can get assistive technology to get that cut up in smaller pieces. Don't let dental issues be a barrier in not getting the protein that you need. And of course, there's also plant proteins, so lentils and beans and things like that. So mix it up and you can often get what you need with just simple switches here and there. Before we move on, remember that you can always pair this with an optional serving of fruit and dairy. And as often as possible, you want to get an unsweetened beverage. So we'll talk about hydration in just a few minutes. Let's move on to our next slide. Now that we've covered malnutrition and sarcopenia, the next factor that influences us is vitamin D. And a lot of studies have been showing that vitamin D helps to reduce falls risks through its direct effect on muscle cells. And so what vitamin D does is it works with calcium. They're good pals. And if you have enough vitamin D, it's going to let a lot of calcium into your cell and that improves your muscle contraction and it helps to build muscle fibers. So it's a good team to have on your side. Now, importantly enough, if you are deficient in vitamin D, you may see impaired muscle strength and even neuromuscular function. So we don't want this to happen. Right now, research is telling us that correcting this deficiency may reduce falls risk, but there isn't enough evidence to make a specific recommendation of how much we need. So right now, current evidence recommends that we get enough vitamin D, and if there's a deficit, that we make sure we take a supplement or some other way to get that back to normal levels. And I've listed some considerations here these are just other details for you to keep in mind because oftentimes when there's insufficient evidence, I want you to know why. And these are some background studies that occurred. So some have seen that studies identified vitamin D supplementation only reduced falls in adults who are also um, had enough calcium. Uh, others mentioned that they worked at different doses. So we're really tr still trying to figure out what works. 
um, a lot of them found that supplementing was really successful, but some would do small doses throughout the year, whereas others would do big, high doses less frequently. So we're trying to find that sweet spot of what works best. And keep in mind that excess vitamin D can also enhance kidney stones. So you don't want that. Um, you wanna make sure that you're getting enough in without doing too much. So if you're concerned about your vitamin D levels, don't worry, your primary care team can be looking out for this for you. So take a look to the next slide and I'm gonna tell you some key things that you can do right now to help make sure that you're getting enough vitamin D in. Of course, we wanna make sure that we're getting a lot of vitamin D in our diet. And you can see sources of vitamin D shown here. Keep in mind though that dietary intake alone is typically not enough to meet our needs. This is where good old sunshine comes in. <laughs> and if you haven't been outside today, I highly encourage it. Current recommendations tell you to get at least 10 to 30 minutes of midday sunlight because that's when the, the sun is highest in the sky. And you wanna do this several times per week at least. But something that often goes unnoticed is depending on your complexion, you might have different needs. People with darker skin tones actually need more time in the sun. So keep that in mind that you wanna make sure you're getting enough. And the reason that this is so important in older adults is because oftentimes when we're older than 65, we might decrease our sun exposure and therefore we're not getting enough and we're at higher risk of vitamin D deficiency. Again, as I mentioned, if you think that you cannot get enough or you're just feeling like you might be deficient, talk to your primary care team and they can see if a vitamin D supplement would be right for you. I've noted a couple details on here that if you do have a recommendation to get a vitamin D supplement, you can get it over the counter. They're relatively inexpensive. And I do want to give you a pro tip here. Anytime you purchase a supplement, you want to see that it has a label like the one shown here. It says USP. That stands for US Pharmacopoeia. This is a third party vendor and it checks the quality of the ingredients of the supplement because supplements are not regulated by the US government. So you wanna make sure that you're getting one that actually has what it says it has. This is one of the many third party vendors out there who will actually do that check for you. So just a little pro tip, if you ever buy a supplement, make sure you see at least some kind of third party vendor on there. And this is one example of those. All right, so I've been crowding your mind with a lot, right? We've got malnutrition, we did vitamin D, and let's round out the day with some dehydration tips. Well, actually tips to prevent dehydration. <laughs> um, this is the third factor that's been shown to increase risks of falls. And so far there has been no evidence found to contradict this. So this is very strong. Right now we see a lot of different causes of dehydration and you can see them here. But one of those is that our kidney function changes as we age, and that's just natural, but that can disrupt our hydration levels. Taking a peek at the next slide, let's really hone in on some ways that you can prevent dehydration. Older adults and adults in general should aim to consume about 64 ounces of fluids per day. And you may have seen this. In the past, they used to have big campaigns of eight ounces of eight glasses, all these good things. Know that this varies from individual to individual. The more calories you intake, the more fluids you need, but on average, it's about 64 to 68 ounces. But keep in mind that this is fluid intake, so it doesn't have to just be water. A lot of people can add soups, vegetables with high water content, even smoothies. Those count towards your fluid requirements. So adding those in as you can can help you meet that goal without feeling like it's too overwhelming. Another thing to keep in mind is that you wanna keep your beverages mixed up. So you can use unsweet tea, black coffee, or even non-sugared sweetened sparkling water. They're super um, efficient, they come in different flavors and they don't have any sugar added to them. So if you're into that sort of thing, they can be really refreshing, especially on a hot Atlanta day. So keeping that in mind. One little asterisk I do wanna tell you is that different people may have different fluid needs depending on chronic conditions that they're living with. So make sure you're checking with your care team to make sure that you're getting enough fluid in or just the right amount because we don't wanna go over your recommendation. And one of the things that has been really shown to be successful in studies is making fluids available. How many of you out there carry a water bottle, a water bottle with you? Maybe, maybe not. I just recently made myself bring one around and look, it's very vintage looking. It looks like I'm in 12th, 12th grade maybe, I don't know. But I'm forcing myself to get that hydration in because it's constantly available and I have it ready to drink. 
So one thing you can do is just kind of keep that exciting, buy a fun one if you like a certain style, or even keep a chilled pitcher of a beverage in your fridge so you have it at easy access. All right, I'm taking a peek at our time and we're just gonna wrap up really quick. These are a couple tips that can help you get these things in while you are stuck inside in this pandemic. Um, of course, with muscle maintenance, making sure you're getting consistent intake throughout the day. One way to do this is anytime you have a snack, make sure you're pairing your carbohydrates with a protein. And you can see some options there, but make sure you get that protein in. It's so, so important. And as Angie and Amber mentioned, there's so many different resources out there to help you stay fit and get that resistance training in. So make sure you take advantage of those. Even when you're looking for vitamin D sources, canned foods can actually be a really great source. So canned salmon, mackerel, sardines, those are great to just have as a meal or part of a snack. Um, so make sure that you're getting those and getting outside as much as you can. And I already mentioned our hydration tips, but really make sure that you're varying this and getting it in in different ways. You can add some lemon juice in or maybe some fresh fruit to your water. Just kind of give it some kick so that you're, if you're like me, you're a little bit more excited to drink your water. And if we move over to the next slide, we are almost done. We've covered quite a lot today, and I hope that I didn't leave you feeling overwhelmed. Just know that if you need a little bit of assistance, your care team is looking out for you. Registered dietitians and primary care providers are trained to look at all the different factors that affect your nutrition status. So if you do feel like they would be helpful, feel free to reach out to them because they will be able to give you an individualized plan. And taking a look at our next slide, there's just a few more things that I'll tell you before we say goodbye today. If you are taking care of someone or perhaps you're a care partner with someone that you live with, these are just a few things that you should keep in mind because while what I covered is really geared toward older adults, a lot of the tips overlap with people of all ages. So making sure that you're really setting that stage and asking these questions. Are they getting enough? How is their appetite? If they have dentures, are they fitting correctly? So you have a really powerful tool to be those first eyes on the ground to getting them what they need. Making sure if you see something to connect them, make sure you get them a resource to shopping, cooking, dentistry. And of course, if they have specific requests, make sure you get them to their care team. This is a summary of the things that we covered today. I know it's a bit, but I just wanted to give you this one quick sheet to give you some information that you can carry easily or put on your fridge. And that should hopefully help you along the way. For other information, Take a look at these resources. This is what we offer here in Georgia for our congregate meals, our home delivered meals, and our Georgia Health Matters website that I saw was posted in the chat. This is a great resource for evidence-based wellness programs, and we do hope you take advantage of those. So there's other resources that I have on the next slides in case you're interested in learning more about this topic. I encourage you to check those out, and I really appreciate your time today. So we'll take some questions, but stay away from falls. Make sure you get your nutrition in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee, and, and thank you also to Amber and to Angie. Hi, everyone. This is Elizabeth Head. I'm your kind of your co-background moderator with all the chat and letting folks in. It's so great to see everyone on here today and to have such amazing subject matter experts in the field that really make this sort of more complex content really relatable. Um, so we're going to take a, a few minutes for questions. Please do type your questions into the chat um to everyone and i'll get them read to our speakers for today um and while folks are thinking of and writing out a couple of questions in that chat box i do have um, a couple of questions that have already come in um, this first one is for amber or, or angie um, can patients still see specialists for example physical therapists while staying physically distant yeah i'll let angie take that one Absolutely. Um, and as I had uh, just briefly touched on, when we started um, implementing the idea for telehealth as through this falls prevention um, project that we're doing um, or evaluating falls risk, it didn't seem feasible that we would be able to carry out some physical therapy assessments or exercises to evaluate those risks. But um, we're seeing that we're able to carry that out. Uh, physical therapists are actually doing telehealth appointments, not necessarily for um, an initial consult, but for established patients. Um, if they have already been evaluated for physical therapy, they're able to continue carrying out most of these exercises at home. Um, even simple equipment that they um, can get to the patients they've been able to send. Um, and as far as their specialists, 
Um, it might take um, a little bit of a delay time of getting in because they are spacing out the patients. They're not quite up to um, their, when I last discussed with my particular practice that I'm working with, they're at about 70% capacity. So um, the schedules look a little different. Um, whereas before they might double book um, patient slot time slots for being evaluated. Um, those appointment times are looking a little bit differently, but absolutely they're still able to be seen by their specialist, um, whether it be um, a specialty physician or provider, or if it's something in the arena of um, physical therapy or occupational therapy. Awesome, thank you ladies for that. Um, I do have a question for Ms. Renee. Um, this is about fluid intake. Um, shocking to hear that you don't just have to have 64 ounces of water. It can be any fluid. I, we, the question is really around sugar. So it, is, is there a point where fluid with lots of sugar is no longer helpful or counting towards that 64 ounces of fluid? Like, how's that work? Um, and I can relate to this question because I, I, I like sugar. <laughs> That's an excellent question. And to be honest, a fluid is a fluid is a fluid to your body. However, you do want to avoid sugar sweetened beverages as much as possible because even though your body is going to intake that as a fluid, it's going to cause a spike in your blood sugar that's not going to be as great. So it's not really going to affect your hydration status, but it will affect your blood sugar. And one thing I will say to that is that people who often have a lot of sweetened beverages will drink less throughout the day because they're getting full. And that can actually cause you to have dehydration because you're not getting enough. Because even though you get that in, it doesn't actually meet your needs. So I know that's not a fun answer, but try to avoid it as much as you can. I'm hearing balance is, is what I'm hearing. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for that, Renee. Um, I have had another, another question come in. This one is for uh, Amber and Angela. Um, can telehealth adequately help people who are worried about falling? Yeah, I think Angie is a great one to answer that as well, because she, she walks through our fall assessments with me. <laughs> um, absolutely, again, um, going back to um, our falls prevention and, and falls risk, um, the study that we're doing um, through Emory and working with a, a group uh, affiliated with um, under the Emory Healthcare system, um, absolutely, we've been able to um, evaluate patients. There is rarely a time where um, most of my assessments, a, a large portion is, of course, um, answering questions about medication regimen um, and looking for hazards in the home and evaluating you know, their previous medical history if, if they've had a fall in the year. But we have been successfully able to um, as I mentioned previously, evaluating blood pressure, which is important for falls risk. You know, sometimes patients that have that um, a huge shift in blood pressure, um, some don't even realize it, um, or an increase of fall risk. So we're able to accomplish blood pressure readings. Um, we are actually able to do a visual acuity or assess for visual acuity with an eye chart that we can um, share my screen um, on Zoom. And we do um, a, a brief eye exam to make sure that there are visual disturbances that could be attributing to their fall risk. Um, and then we're able to do, um, I'm able to, I've worked very closely with two physical therapists that are employed through Emory University who are amazing. And I'm able to accomplish doing physical therapy assessments and exercises assessing them. So it's, um, like I said, it's been really exciting for us because Whereas initially when we started thinking about how are we going to transform this assessment and is it going to be an adequate enough assessment to be able to determine um, if they're at fall, if they're at a fall risk, or even if we can carry this out in the clinic versus seeing them at home um, through a Zoom meeting. And we have been tremendously successful. Um, and that's on behalf of the team. Amber has been um, hugely instrumental and as well as our interviewers that ask the appropriate questions and getting this um, assessment set up, getting camera angles, getting them on Zoom, helping them understand. But it's, it's, a it's been completely feasible to transform. So um, it's been really exciting for us. So I feel like we have um, maybe even in some aspects had a little bit more of an opportunity to truly assess all of their needs because I'm not on that 15 minute, you know, time frame that we delegated in the clinic, I can spend yeah. 45 minutes with a patient if they just want to talk about their concerns or their, um, 
other things that they can maybe be doing. So I've, I've really enjoyed this telehealth model that we've, that we've been able to accomplish. I love that. Thank you. Such a, such a great response. Um, I'm going to pop the national council on aging or Megan is doing it because she is Johnny on the spot um, uh, for self-assessment of your risk for a fall folks um, in the chat window. Now is the national council on aging healthy um, falls free checkup. Um, you, you answer the questions online and they will actually then email you um, and, and give you some results related to your fall risk um, um, as sort of suggested by the, your answers to the questions. Super easy. Um, I'm always suspect of stuff like that, um, even if it's from a great organization, <laughs> National Council on Aging, but it is based on the steady assessment um, that is used clinically and it gives you one, an idea of what you can what your issues might be. And then two, and really important here, this gives you something to take to your doctor and say, here, here are some of my issues and my concerns. Help me understand this and let's talk about this as a team. Um, I think we have time for, for just one more question. This is probably directed at Renee, but might also be directed for Angela and Amber. Um, related to our topic today, if there were one or two questions um, or, or even tests related to nutrition that you would specifically recommend that a patient advocate to get, what would those be? Absolutely. I would say when you're talking to your care team, one is vitamin D. Make sure that you can request that you get your vitamin D checked. It's not that your care providers aren't looking out for you, but they may not know that you're vitamin D deficient because it's not always included in the labs that they run. So bring that up in casual conversation. You know, I'm older. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind checking my vitamin D status. Are there any recommendations that you need? That's the first. And the second is that if you truly want an individualized approach, try to get connected to a registered dietitian because instead of doing a lab test, what they can do is sit down and conduct an interview with you. They will literally go through your day to day. You know, what's breakfast look like? Do you have breakfast? And make minor changes. So keep in mind that everybody is different. And if you're looking for more information, visit eatright.org, which is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics website. It will show you where a registered dietitian is near you. And if you can't get connected to one, there's tons of information on there that's evidence-based and will help you along the way. That's so perfect. Um, Amber or Angela, um, from your perspective, is there anything you'd like to see folks asking you in telehealth in terms of a self-advocacy role that you don't get as often as you would think? Maybe, maybe not. And, and, I'll, and I want to, um, and to elaborate um, from what Renee, yes, I mean, as, as I'm seeing these um, individuals and these patients, um, I encourage them anything that they feel like that needs to be um, discussed as far as if they have concerns um, specifically around falls and, and, you know, most of them that I, these individuals that I'm talking to, if they are still fortunate enough to have parents still um, living have told me that it's been, you know, a detriment, a, a fall was a huge, um, just changed their outcome of their health situation. And so we talk about, um, like Renee mentioned, vitamin D, that's something that's not typically, insurance of course dictates so much now, unfortunately. And vitamin D is one of the things that about two years ago was taken off the wellness panel and insurance companies don't want to pay for it anymore. But um, you know, three out of four people are going to be vitamin deficient, D, uh, deficient in um, vitamin D. And um, you know, I tell people getting back to you know conversations even about exercising and getting outside. It's incredibly important to get some sun exposure so our body can synthesize that vitamin D and become make it into an active form. And we talk about you know, it's important to talk to your doctors about it because it's going to help in bone health and prevention um, of osteoporosis or if they already have bone loss, further preventing. Um, so I try to encourage the patients that while you're there, you get, you know, it's often you only get one appointment a year that is this whole encompassing um, from, you know, comprehensive health visit. So make a list of questions. And when you go in, anything that's on your mind or that's been a concern, um, you know, the physician um, is there and unfortunately just given insurance um, restrictions again, they're not able to necessarily, you know, ask you 
all the questions that they may um, have time for. So you, it's you as a patient that have to kind of advocate for yourself and those concerns. That's beautiful. Thank you all so much. Um, we are just about 60 seconds until 11 a.m. I would like to thank each of our speakers. Um, I would like to thank all of our attendees. Um, as a reminder, we are working to put these up on YouTube. Um, it's a lot of video with a lot of really fantastic content. So we were like, yeah, it'll be five minutes to edit. No, 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 it takes a little bit. So um, we are working on that and hoping to have those up here in the next week. Um, if you, yeah, everyone had to register for these, so please expect an email that says, you know, thank you for attending. Here's a super brief survey. And by the way, the videos are all up on YouTube in case you happen to miss a week. Um, again, thank you all so much. Thank you for helping to make Falls Free Fridays and a virtual world an enormous success. Um, I, we've learned something every week. Um, please remember to be happy and be safe. Um, and have fun because that's all, all we can do in uh, this crazy world. Um, thanks everyone.